I am um, welcoming Angelo. I don't know how to say your last name, so just say Angelo. <laughs> He's from Simply Perfect. Always Awake, which I'm sure you'll know him from that. Um, I met Angelo maybe like 2014. I was thinking about it before the talk. I went out to do talks, I think, in Colorado. Can't remember where in Colorado, but somewhere. And we, um, yeah, we ended up spending the weekend and traveling around together a bit while I was doing talks. Um, and I remember you took me out in your car, which is like an off-road car, and allowed me to drive it, which was very exciting. Yeah, you did a good job, considering <laughs> it's the opposite way of driving, yeah. I guess. From yeah, yeah. Although I'm really used to it now, but back then I wasn't. Um, mm. uh, and yeah, I just remember being um, yeah super impressed by your openness and your honesty, and yeah, just your you were like beaming and full of energy. That's what I remember as well. And then through the years, we kind of kept in contact on and off. And um, and I've watched you grow your channel. I don't think you, I think you spoke to people individually when I met you then, you told me about, but I don't think you spoke to groups. And then I remember you speaking to a group. And then I remember getting people that came to my talks that have been recommended to me from you, like Tyler is one of them, and mm. um, who I still speak with, actually. Yeah. And um yeah, and then you interviewed me last week, and I thought, you know, I really don't know so much about your story. I know a little bit, um, but not so much. And I thought, why not interview you so people that listen to my channel can get to know you? And then also I can learn about your past and your history. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love your background, by the way. Oh, like back just, here? Just, yeah, just all the, like, film set, like, <laughs> yeah yeah all this like soundproofing um yeah it, it really helps uh with sound like recordings and stuff instead of hearing like an echoey room it's yeah generally yeah you know pretty pretty good sound but yeah is it in your basement or something uh actually no it's in my house upstairs in like a loft area it was okay. kind of like a multi-use room that doesn't have a door so i didn't really know what to put in here and i put my computer in here and then over time i Put, set it up so I could film in here and then I put the soundproofing and all of it yeah so it's, it's like my office but it's really where I just make all the videos and stuff yeah nice yeah. so tell me I don't I don't know if I know this I think that your story is something that you had a spontaneous awakening without any spiritual knowledge that's what I think I remember you saying but you have to tell me like how did you get into this subject or what happened yeah. I remember that you deeply suffered like myself mm -hmm. at, um in like late yeah. teens and early 20s yeah and then something happened, but I can't remember that got you into this when you were a medical student, sure. maybe, or prior to becoming a medical mm -hmm. student, you were yeah. like, not sure what to do. And then mm -hmm. afterwards you decided, yeah, so yeah, let's exactly. go. Yeah. So, um, you know, when people ask how I became interested in this subject, awakening, non-duality, whatever you want to call it, um, the, the, the simple, straightforward and, and honest answer is just true suffering, like suffering mm -hmm. in the Buddhist sense, the, the, the sense of something just being profoundly dissatisfying in a way that, um, nothing in the human, in, in the human realm that people talked about could address, you know, I, people talked about, oh, do this to make yourself feel better, exercise, learn, you know, all the different things to like improve yourself, improve your life, improve relationships, all of it. I, I could see the value of it in a sense in the relative world, but through direct experience, trying it and actually instinctually, I just knew that was not it. That was not, that wasn't what I needed. It may work for other people. And I could see that it did work for other people, which made the the desperation kind of even worse. I felt like, man, I am alone. Like the, my family, people around me, they don't know what this is. I don't know what this is, but it's not right. Something's not, something's just off about the way I'm experiencing myself, you know, in reality and so forth. Um, <clears throat> I think in very young childhood, I, I felt rather present. Like there was just presence a lot of the time, but by older childhood, I started feeling like emotional, intense things from other people. Like I would be walking down the street and I would watch, see somebody walk by a person I didn't know. And I could feel all their sadness mm -hmm. and I wanted to help them. Like I wanted to, I just, and you know, my parent would like, pull me along. Don't, don't stare at people. You know, yeah. I mean, I literally empathize that much as a, as a child, 
Um, and so I remember like the emotional tone of things and of my family, my parents who were reasonably unhappy. And I remember just taking on that emotion tone, but I think there was still a lot of, um, presence there. Like I, I could sort of in a sense, absorb it or it could pass through, but I remember pretty clearly when I really started forming a mental identity, like a, a thought-based identity, especially as we talked about in your interview, um, around like puberty, around becoming socially aware, where identity mm. becomes very much bound into the social structure and what people think of me and whether I'm wearing the right clothing and all these weird things that didn't matter one year ago. Suddenly I was like really hyper aware of it. And I don't know if it's causal, but with that, there was like a, a an order of magnitude of an increase in internal struggle, strife, mental something. And I remember very clearly like a thought that just kept going in circles in my mind. It just was like, what is wrong with me? What is What the fuck is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? And it was really painful because it has that shame tone to mm -hmm. it when, when you feel like you are that, when you are that apparatus of thinking. And I was identified with it or identifying with it as it was solidifying. And it felt like, a fucking pressure cooker. It was absolutely horrible. It was, and I could look around and see people around me with various levels of like angst or anxiety. And I could see that, but this was like amplified. It was just so far beyond, like even my instincts knew it was beyond the narrative and story that I was going through. It was just so intense. Um, and, and, and the more I tried to think my way out of it, the more I thought my way into it. It was like, I was, I was trying to use thought to get out of the problem of thought. And it just felt like this cage that got tighter and tighter and tighter. And it was really, really brutal. And I felt that in my, probably from the time I was like 14 or 15 and it just got worse and worse and it just built mm. into my adulthood. Mm. Um, and so that's really as best as I can identify what, what really drove me toward that interest. Even through that time, I was sort of interested in Eastern thought. I was like interested in martial arts, um, you know, the, the sort of you know, American masculine version of Eastern thought or something, but that was my way in. I was interested and I didn't know what I was looking for in it, but it, even that felt sort of unsatisfying. Like I hadn't really gotten to the crux of what I was interested in. I would occasionally read like Buddhist quotes or even like a koan or something, but trying to like put it through the mind as, as my mind was so structured and identified didn't make sense. It was just like, what the fuck is, it doesn't make any sense. You know, mm -hmm. I would read the Tao Te Ching and I would just go, yeah, like there's got to be something here, but it doesn't make any sense to me. So there was like an, a sort of introduction to to that type of thought without any instinctual knowing that that's what's going to break this spell of of identity. Um, and so that I, I would say that was kind of the the from the mental standpoint, how the mental version of Angelo started getting interested in this. Yeah. Um, but it didn't start to really feel like something more alive was happening yet until maybe around 18 or so I would say and, um, and were you interested in school at that time with the suffering or was it like just school everything was not so interesting you no know, I to you? yeah I was I, I was really so emotionally repressed that I just didn't care like I was smart and I liked science there were subjects I knew I enjoyed and I had a good rapport with some of my teachers but they would endlessly just say, why don't you ever do your homework? You never do your homework. You never, mm. you, you, you do really well on the test, but you don't do, so my grades weren't very good. I wasn't, I just didn't care. Like I didn't care mm. about the things people cared about because I couldn't find out. I couldn't figure out why I should care. I was just yeah. miserable, you know? Yeah. So what I did was party. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So I would drink, try to drink it away, try to smoke it, all this stuff, which didn't work either. And in fact, yeah. it was interesting. Like for, I remember the first time I smoked pot, and it was like, looking back, it was a literal non-dual experience. It was non-dual. Like I felt, I could feel it. And it was so like, whoa, I love this. I'm going to do it again. And I did it again. And I kind of felt it. And like the third time I did, I was miserable. It was like completely mind identified again. Now there's even more emotional repression. You know, psychedelics kind of did the same thing. It was just like bringing all this emotion up that I had no idea how to work with or deal with. Mm. And, you know, so, so interestingly, like psychedelic substances and so forth that I, that I sort of dabbled in um, did bring an experiential taste, I think, mm. but I had no way of integrating it or relating it to a practice or an inquiry, or I just, it, it was just something that just happened and it was gone. And then mm. you tried to take the, I tried to take the drug again and it wasn't, wasn't the same. It just felt like paranoia and like not very comfortable experiences. 
So, um, so that was like the kind of collection of my experiences. And yeah, I was, I was interested in, well, shit, I might as well try to feel good when I can, because I'm miserable, you know, and even that didn't work. Even feeling good didn't feel good to me. It was yeah. that bad. <laughs> yeah. Nothing felt good. You know, it was just kind of like dysphoria, what I would say, which when I was in it was absolutely horrible. Looking back, mm -hmm. it was grace. It was yeah. grace. Yeah. It pushed me hard. It pushed me really hard. <laughs> yeah. When I found the portal, when I found the, when I found the hole in, in the side of reality, I went, <laughs> I was like full on, man. I'm not going, I'm not stopping. I don't care if there's anything left of me. I'm good. I'm, uh, I'm out of here, you know? So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, all that kind of stuff had happened is the background suffering. And that that's, that's how I felt growing up. Um, and then I had taken a class in Buddha. I wrote this in my book. I, I had taken a class in Eastern. It was like Eastern religion in undergrad. Maybe I was 18 or 19 at the time. And we just learned about like, we just learned about it topically. And I never had a taste that like, there's something here that's alive, so, so to speak. And I remember one day we had a, a substitute professor and our, our professor was sick and they just found some random dude who strangely wasn't a professor. He was a local, he was a Buddhist like monk at a local center in Denver or something. Yeah, <laughs> some random dude. And he came in and he just started talking about Buddhism. And he's like, okay, here's, you know, here's Buddhism. Here's what suffering is. And I'd heard all this before. Like I'd heard, you know, the, the Four Noble Truths, Buddha, life is suffering and all that. I'm like, yeah, no shit, life is suffering. Like, what are you gonna do? You know, I don't wanna wait 20 lifetimes. He's talking and all of a sudden, all of a sudden I was so clear that what he was talking about was something that could happen right now like in this life right now to you, to me, you know? And I remember I was like, oh, I was like, ah, you know, put my hand up. And he, and he said, uh, he asked what I wanted to, he wanted, what, what my question was. And I said, this thing that you're talking about, I was like, can this actually happen now? Like, can this happen to somebody who's alive right now? And he, I swear he did this. He, he stopped and he kind of smiled and he took like two steps forward and he like literally leaned forward to me and he just said, there's no doubt. Oh. And he looked at me for a couple seconds and he just stepped back and started talking again. I was like, whoa. And I mean, the, I mean, it felt different. The room felt different. Like it was, yeah. it was a mystical experience just to have that transmission. But more importantly, he transmitted a message and I, yeah. I had no idea how it was going to happen. I didn't interpret it strangely as I was going to take it through a Buddhist path or go find this guy and join his monastery. It had, I had nothing of that flavor, but something in me knew like, whoa, okay, there's, there's a way out of this. Like, why, why has no one said this to me? You know? Um, so that kind of like, was a pre-taste I think for me. And then there were a couple other experiences, one specific one where I had just learned to meditate. I learned transcendental meditation from this old hippie who learned it from, uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in India in the sixties. And he had been teaching TM ever since, but he didn't teach it in the regular TM um, group. He just did it on his own. And he said he was kind of a, like an outlaw. They didn't really like him because he didn't do it the way, you know, but he did it the way Maharishi taught him. Anyway, he taught me TM. So he taught me to meditate, which I had never known how to do. Uh, and I was so excited to learn it. And the first day I did it, it was like all in my head. I'm like, ah, this sucks. Why, why can't I meditate? And I was trying to say the mantra and all this shit. And just, it was just frustrating as shit. And, uh, it's like, okay, another thing that doesn't work, just, you know, whatever. And, but I was like, oh, but I'm going to keep doing it, you know, because he told me to keep doing it. So I did it every day. And then I, I remember about two weeks in, like something definitely happened, like something shifted. I don't know what it was, but it was during meditation. And for about two days, it was just blissful. It was like oh. blissful flow. Um, I understood. I got it. I got this wow. somehow. I couldn't say it, but I got it. And it was mm -hmm. like, you know, wow. And I remember calling my the guy who taught me and I was like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've never felt peace ever. Like, I don't even know what this is, but oh my God. And I remember him telling him everything's a continuum. It's all continuum. It's all one. It's all connected. Like I had no idea. I've heard people say that, but I thought they were just blabbing on about their ideas, you know? And he was laughing. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. So then of course, two, about two days that lasted and then it went completely away. And it was, that was the worst I've ever felt in my entire life. It was yeah. absolutely horrible that it was yeah. like, where the fuck did that go? Why won't it come back? Yeah. Um, and then and what, and um, what was the T TM meditation? Like, I've never done TM, I don't think. Is it a they mantra use, you a do? Mantra. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. mantra. Yeah, they use a mantra and they kind of teach. It's a it's a good way of teaching meditation. I think it's really you. good for um, high IQ people as well, mantras. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree because it, it, it steers you away from thoughts, but without mm. until it, it's like adding something else there that you can move your attention to instead of mm -hmm. just thoughts, 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 or trying to push yeah. thoughts away, which doesn't work yeah. very long, right? 
Um, so yeah. And, and that was, that was a few years before what I would call the awakening. And for the next, I had an instinct though, that, that said, you can't chase that. I can't imagine that thing that happened for two days and just try to force it to happen again. I just instinctually knew I couldn't do that. Mm. So, so it was more like, okay, I guess I'll wait it out and just suffer. So I kind of learned a little bit more maturity in life and like work, work ethic and tried to go to college, but I couldn't figure out what to do. So I kind of dropped out after a year and a half and I was like working in restaurants and stuff. So I was doing all that. And, um, one of the things, so this, I'm going to zip fast forward when I was 24 years old, suffering, like I always had the meditation was really nice. And it was like water in the desert, but it was 30 minutes twice a day. Every, every other hour of the day was pretty much suffering. <laughs> and it, it was just, it was just miserable, you know? And so it's, um, a, it's, a, it's really beautiful that the meditation had such a profound effect. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's yeah, for some it people and, it really touches them and some people it really doesn't. It's really beautiful. Yeah, it really, it really helped, but it, but it didn't, it was a, it was a drop of water in a yeah. vast ice bucket of suffering. <laughs> yeah. So, but that again, grace like it set everything up perfectly so uh, i was 24 and i had uh like for one of the first times in my life i had a girlfriend which i'd never had before i was too emotionally repressed and like just you know i couldn't physically get close to somebody i would like either just leave or say something to push them away kind of i just i I, and i knew it but i didn't know why and i don't know what it was but anyway so i was 24 and i had this girlfriend for not very long but i remember something in me was like, oh yeah, this is what I've always wanted. This is what's always been missing, right? The lover, that's what you need. And then pretty quickly, I realized that doesn't work either. That also did not make me stop suffering, right? Which again, it's grace. Like, I'm so glad that happened. And we like, we broke up, you know, and I remember knowing, of course, why we broke up, we had to break up. It wasn't going to work and all that. But, but that then all this suffering turned into the suffering plus not just desperation, but absolute surrender. Because I realized the one thing I had held out that would actually work didn't work at all. And I could see that it would never work. I might even find the best partner in the world is still not gonna, it's not gonna fix this problem. I could tell. And then I just felt it was like a desperation, but also it started to shift into this sort of like acquiescence and like a surrender. Like I was ready to surrender at that point to whatever, but I needed to find it, right? And it was right around the time of that breakup I had this book called The Three Pillars of Zen, which I had never opened. And I think I had it for a class that I had taken or someone bought it for Christmas for me. And I literally never even opened it. And I picked it up and I opened it to this chapter that said Enlightenment Accounts. And it was talking about, in Zen, they call Ken Cho, which is the, the Satori, that first shift, the first awakening. And it was like nine different chapters of people who wrote in their own words what it was like going through it very clearly. And I was like, oh my God, this is what that guy was talking about, that professor. And I knew it. And I could see in Zen, they use like often use a koan called mu, or they may use shikantaza, which is natural meditation. They're very opposite approaches in a sense, but either way it can culminate in Kensho. So I just started reading these and I was like, I could feel it. I could feel the flavor of mm-hmm. it. I, I, I was like, oh, I know what they're pointing to. I can feel this. And then with, and so during meditation, I started to kind of apply what the Zen teacher had mentioned to them and how he had pointed to them. And, um, I remember one, I remember one night I was sitting and meditating. I remember everything about it, where I was in the room. I remember everything. And I was meditating and I was, I could feel this. And I would say for about two weeks before this night, um, I could just feel something happening. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was, but I could feel something happening. And there was kind of a turning inward. That was not a intentional thing. It was something kind of, it was like dying inward almost. But anyway, so that night I was sitting and I remember just noticing thoughts in a way I never had. And it would, a thought would come and I would say, that's a thought. And then there would just be Mm. this sort of, this sort of gap and another thought would come. And I would just say to myself, there's another thought, there's another thought. And then the mind would get quiet. And then there'd be this underlying impression. That's like, oh, it's very quiet. And I'd be like, oh my God, that's a thought. And then something would be like, oh, it's happening. And I'd be like, that's a thought. And then every <laughs> single impression that was formed by my mind was, I realized was just another thought, including sensation. I would, I would notice a sensation and I would even notice that the noticing of a sensation was also a thought. It was a reflection in consciousness. And I just noticed that again and again. And mm-hmm. then it started happening automatically where I didn't have to say that's a thought. And I, it was like attention just kept turning to this, this experience of pure consciousness. Mm-hmm. 
And then all of a sudden there was literally only pure consciousness. There mm -hmm. was no watcher, no, it's not a, it's not like I'm sitting here watching thoughts go by. It was nothing like that. The sense of a subject in consciousness that, that was always overlooked because I was looking out at thoughts and pushing and pulling on thoughts. And I thought that was the world and myself and my life, you know, all this, all of a sudden that collapsed in, in, into itself. And there was, it felt like radical, intimately, consciously conscious with no need to think to confirm it. That was, mm -hmm. it was self-validating. There was no need to, there was no need to mm. overtly have a thought to confirm what this was, but mm. I, I can't say what it is. It was just, it was just that. Um, and it stayed like that absolutely neutral, but just profoundly like peaceful. Finally, first time in my life. And um, yeah, I sat in it for a bit and there was this, there was a definitely a f fear barrier. Oh, I'm going to back up just real briefly. So about, I want to say four or five months before this something like this started to happen. And there was this massive fear and right. I backed out of it and I stood up and I stopped meditating. I was like, mm. Mm, I don't know what that was, but that was fucking terrifying. <laughs> but, but about a month after that, I had this instinct just out of the blue that said, if that happens again, go through it. Mm. So, so when this happened, when, when there was just consciousness, there was a fear, the body felt fear, but there was no narrative at all. It was a physiologic mm. fear response. And the instinct was there, just go, just let go. And then all of a sudden it was, it got even deeper and it was just this pure, everything was consciousness. There was mm. nothing but consciousness, nothing. It, there's no way to talk about it, but, yeah. but I had a few instincts about it. One of them was, okay, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. I'm going to go to work and do all the things I have to do, but I'm going to come home and I'm going to sit and I'm going to go here because why wouldn't I? Everything I ever thought was real. Everything I ever thought was a problem. Myself, others, all of it is, is just structured in this. That's, mm. it was, it's just this, you know, why, what else would I ever do? I was like, I fucking <laughs> won the lottery. Like I won the lottery. I don't care if I have friends. I don't care. You know? Um, so, and I, so that was one impression and I was so, so relieved. It was just such a deep and profound relief. I've never felt relief like that. Even at, even right. the weird shit that happened afterwards. Um, the other impression was, and it, it was odd because I knew this, but I don't know why I knew it, but something in me said, this is what everyone wants. And I mm. knew this is what spiritual people are looking for. And I don't, I didn't know why I knew that because I didn't really know spiritual people. Mm. It was like this old voice that came from somewhere that I didn't know. It was very strange, but I didn't care. I was like, whatever thoughts, you know, and I just stayed in it and it was so peaceful and I fell asleep in it. I woke up the next day. It was still there. And I, I meditated. Oh no, I woke up. I could feel it. I went and took a shower. I couldn't wait to sit and meditate because I could still feel it. And I knew I could go right back into it. Took a shower, sat down to meditate. I had to go to work this day. And I went to meditate and immediately I was back in it. It was just that there was just consciousness. And I was like, okay, this is it. I'll do this the rest of my life, you know? And then, and then a whole other thing happened. This, <laughs> this goes beyond, this goes beyond any ability I've ever found to talk about what it is because it's not anything, but even the consciousness went away. Everything, everything went away. Everything went away. Every sense of, every sense of self, every sense of, not just the subject object experience, but the sense of form was gone, completely gone. Mm. Um, How come do you it's mean here, it's here right you, now? It, it's you, the most, it's the most, it's the most profound, but it's not even profound. It's just not anything. And it's just, it's beyond self. It's beyond the structure of self. And that, that was realized. Um, and at that, from at that moment, which is not even a moment, it's eternity it was realized it doesn't even matter what happens to this body, mind in this lifetime. It's a freaking blip on the radar. Even form itself is just one thing that this can do this, this emptiness. It's not, but it's not empty. It's not formless awareness. It's not like that. It's, it, um, and, and I was there and I, and, and there was a knowing that like, this is always this, and it can be a universe or it can be nothing at all. It doesn't even matter. It can do both mm -hmm. at the same time. And, and I, I was like, it was like, what the, holy, what the hell? Like, it was like a surprise that never stops being surprising. <laughs> it was like a letting go that never stops letting go even of itself. And I just, and that was crazy. It was like in the wall, like in the walls of the house and inside me and other lifetimes. And it was just, do, and I got in my car and I was driving. And I remember thinking, how in the fuck am I driving right now? Like the trees and the car and the body, they were like interpenetrated. And the whole thing was like coming forward as an entire seeming universe to create this appearance and it's not even real it's not even real but energetically it has a an expression in this moment because of whatever and and but it was so obvious this is how it always it's like in a sense i want to say like i'm always here but there's no i in here and there's no here here either but it was that 
natural. It went way beyond mm. that consciousness thing. Um, and then I had a, a few instincts about this. One of them was, <laughs> oh, this this isn't what people want. <laughs> I, I, the first part was like, this is what everyone wants. This was like, I don't think anyone wants this. <laughs> it's, not, it's not wantable. Who would want this? Like, how could you want, you can't want it. You can, you, it's, it, you know, it was so weird. I'm like, oh my God. And I looked around, everyone was empty shells. This is an empty shell. <laughs> and even the shells, it's like, even that's just constructed out of appearances and forms and colors and sensations and sounds. There's nothing to any of it. it, it it's just, and so it was like, what the fuck is happening right now? It was like being in this cosmic fucking circus of what is parading as Angelo's life, driving down the road, going to work to make pizza. Like it was so fucking crazy. And, and then, <laughs> so anyway, that happened and there were, there were, I, I was experiencing the weird thing is that I've never experienced anything like this before that but I was experiencing sort of past lives, but I don't even, I can't even say they were past lives because I'm not sure they're in time and they might be like a, yeah. it might be something like concurrent lifetimes that are that are concurrently alive in other dimensions or something. It's very strange to talk like that, but, but it was more obvious than anything in consciousness. And there was some knowing that this had progressed every time a little bit. And there was like these impressions that in other lifetimes I had stayed in this state of like consciousness and just, just like withdrawn and there was a knowing that that's not going to happen in this lifetime. And there was like this, almost like a disappointment, you know? Um, but since, since that moment, that's never not here, but I, I can't talk about it. And I didn't, I didn't talk about it for about a couple of weeks or maybe a month after I was just so fucking in awe about it, all of it in a way that I did mention it to people. Is it okay if I swear on your channel? I'm sorry. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> So, so I, I did talk to some people and it was transmitting actually to people I knew and stuff. And, but then I could just energetically feel like, no, it's not time for this. Like there's two, there's still emotional stuff that needs to be cleared out and some identity structures based in the mind and beliefs and so forth. But there was no identity underneath it. That's the weird thing. It was like, an, it was, man, if I, if I could say what it's like, it's like, it was like everything was dead and alive at the same time. And there, and there's nothing special about this body versus the sidewalk or a tree. And yet some, that, that death was looking through these eyes. It was like an animated corpse in a way, very strange, but it was also, it's just, it's, I can't even say it was enjoyable. It was just beyond any category of experience yeah. it was beyond human experience. Yes. Um, anyway, so, and you know, this, um, um, and yeah, and yeah, so, yeah you, you describe it really well, actually, like being dead and being alive. Like it's really hard to get there. I mean, I can't guarantee we're talking about the same thing, like in the end, like when it comes to the details, yeah. because it's like really, these are really personal things, even though they're not personal. <laughs> but it's like really hard. But I really like that, like you, you're walking around de not dead or alive and just completely beyond. Yeah, it was almost as if you could say this body mind is like a set of appearances and that everything out there that seemed like separate was a set of appearances, but all those appearances are one fluctuating self-responsive mass, but there's something looking through it that's nothing at all. It's not yeah. even there. It's not even there. And yeah. I, I find these like poetic ways that click, like Dogen says, when one side's illuminated, the other side's dark. Like there's poetic ways of talking about it, but it, there's just no way to talk about it. Yeah. So that that aspect of it, um, which is which is everything also um that i i don't know i just had an instinct i couldn't ever talk about that and i can't still um also i really wasn't sure although i don't think i overtly thought about it that anyone i ever bumped into had ever experienced that i suspected most people hadn't or almost yeah. no one had because no one talks about this kind of stuff so so it was almost like i went through a death experience um, but the body's still animated and mm -hmm. so be it, you know, it just, just do your best at that point, but it never was not the case after seeing that <laughs> I mean, it goes before this, even this lifetime, it's not even bound by the narrative of this lifetime or the energetics of this lifetime or that lifetime or any other mm -hmm. lifetime. So, so yeah, I kind of went quiet about it. I went dark, mm -hmm. like an analogy I might make was if you think about the a very large star when it comes to its death, if it's large enough, it will supernova, which becomes like five mil billion times brighter than the sun or something. And then it, but then it collapses back down into a black hole where it has oh, yeah. all the same mass and energy, but you can't detect it actually, or it's very difficult to detect. That's how this felt. 
it was like this fucking supernova. And then it just went whoop, back down into this thing. And it's always here. Uh, but there's no need to emphasize it, right? It, mm. it, it's all conditions based. So there's whether I emphasize it and talk publicly about it or not, is not up to anyone. It's just what happens. For me, it didn't happen. I, for 15 years, I didn't talk about it at all, even to like the closest person in my life. I never even meant, I never even thought to mention it. I even mm. went and got a Zen teacher and I never told him because mm. I didn't, it didn't even cross my mind. Like, why would anyone want to know this? You know, mm. it's so strange, like looking back, it's hilarious, but, um, but yeah, so it was good. Cause I was like working through conditioning. I went to med school, became a physician. Um, and after that experience, did your conditioning become a lot lighter? Like your experience of life was a lot easier instantly, but it wasn't completely gone. There was a mm. knowing that I was going to look real in this lifetime because, I, again, I had done this before. And it's very easy to have that supernova and sort of stay in the supernova and become a little detached and and maybe even teach it. But there's a there's another at least this took me so many years to put back together. There's a, there's a way that you can you can bring that supernova forth in the relative world and sort of disguise it in a way as being a regular person. There's this <laughs> beautiful line in the uh, eighth ox herding picture, which says the beauty of my garden is invisible mm. inside my gate. A thousand sages do not know me. It's something like that because even I can even fool myself. Like it's, I, I can be a person and not a person at the same time. I can be, it's, it's so fluid. Everything's so fluid. Mm. And so when someone talks to me about what's going on with them, whatever stage of realization they're at. And now I learned enough to, I could actually see those stages and I could see how they collapsed for me, like scaffolding all those years ago, but it happened so fast. I didn't even know what they were. I couldn't clarify. It was just too much. Everything was just gone. Mm. It was like a fucking pile of rubble, you know? Um, but it's beautiful because now I can meet somebody in the relative and absolute at the same time. Yeah. Most of the time, you know, I mean, it always improves. It seems like, and it only improves through experience and through vulnerability on my part. Um, just being willing to meet someone wherever they are and not, not have to try to wake them up, not have to try to bring the absolute into the, the conversation and push them in, mm -hmm. you know, beyond what they're, what they can handle in that moment. Cause that's not skillful. Sometimes it's really helpful. Sometimes, you know, kicking someone straight off into the absolute is what they need in that moment, but not always. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's really just, they just need a hug or they need mm -hmm. someone to say, Hey, all the stuff you've done, all this, you know, stuff you feel so guilty about, like it all makes perfect sense why you did it you did it because that's the only way you knew your conditioning mm. brought you to, and all that, just like loving them where they are, mm. then they'll start often to open to, you know, like, okay, let's, let's start trying to pierce the identity structure and so forth. So for me, looking back, I'm really glad it happened that way to where, um, I really just kept it inside for so long. And mm. again, I didn't feel like I was hiding anything, but I was, I was so averse to talking about anything spiritual that even six or seven years after this, I was in med school and I had mentioned to a few people that I went to a Zen temple in Denver to meditate. That was it. That was the extent of what I talked about. Um, and so a friend of mine from med school was like, oh, you you meditate and stuff. And I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, we're having a group of med students this weekend. Will you teach, the, just do a basic entry, intro to meditation for them? I'm like, oh no, no, no way. No way I would do that. I would never, you know, I wouldn't even think about doing that. Uh, and that's how I felt for for about 15 years about this, this kind of yeah. subject. And strangely, what got me sort of talking about it was like seeing you and seeing some other non-dual people on, on, I remember the first time like seeing, I remember the first time seeing you because I remember you saying this topic, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, what are you talking about? This isn't a topic. This is like, this is like <laughs> reality. Like what? And then, but then I saw what you were doing. I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And, and then I, I was like, you talk about this. Like you actually just talk to people about this, this, you know, because I, I could feel how radically, powerful it is. And I had had moments in my past where like I push people too hard without realizing it. And it mm. really, really, really freaks them out. And so I had to learn also that skillful means of knowing what people can handle and what they can't, because mm. um, it can be really, really dysphoric and confusing for someone to be pushed, you know, mm. out of their identity when they're not ready for it. And specifically when they're not asking for it. Yeah. So I guess I just had to work through a lot of my own stuff and just have some life experience and I guess it was kind of nice to establish myself with a career as well. Um, and then it sort of morphed a little bit into adding this, talking about mm. this stuff. Yeah. And you, you went into a really interesting career. Like, um, like you, yeah. um, I've forgotten the name of your, your job, anesthetist. Yeah. So in, in Europe, it would be an anesthetist or anesthetist. Yeah. Uh, in in um, the U S we call it anesthesiologist. Right. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah, so but take... I've always been fascinated with states of consciousness, obviously, and all that. So I guess it does sort of make sense. Yeah, that's like really a powerful job. Like uh, people placing their trust in you to take away their apparent consciousness. I don't even know. What, I would call it like in the way that I speak, like their personal um, awareness. So I would say there's still consciousness there, but they just can't aren't aware of it on the personal level. Mm-hmm. But I mean, that's just word. It doesn't really matter. I don't, like, um, yeah, it's such a powerful thing to to do, and like so intense. Like, does mm-hmm. it? Does it, is it ever overwhelming the job or you find no, it? it? I find it really, really peaceful. Like things now are very even keel. Like I can be in the middle of a resuscitation for a trauma or I can yeah. be sitting and meditating on my couch and it has this, almost the same tone nowadays. It's very interesting. Yeah. Um, it, I, it's hard to step out and self-reflect on that in a sense, but I, I have had people tell me like, you're really calm when there's a code or like a resuscitation. So yeah, I don't feel like an internal, like intense response. I just feel like, more focus, more, more alertness and focus to like help people know what, what roles they have when this is happening and like delegating and having good closed loop, closed loop communication because the, the stakes are high, obviously when someone needs resuscitation or their heart stops. Um, but, but yeah, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say I find it, um, intense. I don't ever feel anything like burnout or anything. The other thing about anesthesiology though, that really works for me, a click clicked with me is it's very much a protective role. Like it's you're, you have a one-on-one interaction with a patient and your job is to keep them safe. And so something mm-hmm. about Angelo like resonates with that for sure. It's, you know, it always made sense to me, but obviously the states of consciousness aspect is pretty fascinating. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how, and I remember you saying it took an insane amount of time to learn. Like you did like years and years of, yeah, it's 10 cool. years of medical training. And how did you find that? Because I find that my brain, but I, I'm also neurologically diverse, so there's that element to it as well. But I found that um, my brain is like not so good at memorizing <laughs> anymore. Mm-hmm. I, have to, I have to use long-term memory if I'm going to learn anything. But the good thing about that is that when I do decide to learn something, I become very good at it. Mm-hmm. because it's like I have to really learn it on a bodily level. I can't learn it on short-term memory. I don't know, really yeah. understand what's happening there, but it, it's like I have to like really bodily learn something mm-hmm. of my whole body. And you found that you could still do that afterwards? Yeah, so uh, of the medical training, the hardest part was forcing myself to read over and over and memorize. Mm. What I found was exactly what you said, that the long-term memory still functions, But long-term memory is different than executive memory where you're consciously thinking that you're remembering something because what I realize is just repetition. So as long as I read it several times, I'll retain the information, even if there's not a conscious me in there right here believing I'm doing the reading. But it makes it challenging because it's so easy to just sit in presence. Like Mm. there's no reason not to, but for some reason, the conditions were just set up such that I I, I was going to go through medical training. So there were definitely times when it was hard but um, it was mostly just activating the mind so much and pushing it when it's they would rather just sit in samadhi. So mm-hmm. so that the memorization was probably the hardest part. The work wasn't so much like when you do rotations and you're working. That I've I've found more in, engaging and interesting because I'm like now you're helping people. Like you're actually where the rubber meets the road. Your your actions matter and they're helping people or uh, uh, sick and so forth. So it just felt more natural to me. Um, the movement. And, and staying busy in that way, like doing a lot of tasks and so forth, um, didn't have the same really intense heady quality where it's like, read, 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 mm. memorize, memorize, memorize. So it was challenging. It probably would have been easier without that awakening to go through that portion of it, I would think, because it was easier to well, stay in my head. And do you, like, I, I don't know so much about the brain, but I'm sure you had to learn a lo- lot about it. But why do you think it is like this? It, my theory is very limited and I just kind of made it up and listened to other people that speak. I feel like the reason that your short-term memory gets worse is because you're not repeating the story of yourself. Yeah. And there's something along the lines of that. And yeah. and Yeah. So there's like executive memory, which is sort of your frontal lobe. And that's yeah. the sense of being a person inside your head, thinking you're doing everything you're thinking. Right. Right. right? I think that's what most people experience. Right. Hmm. And I know people experience this because they tell me, and that is, I have to remind myself to remember something. And it's like, you don't though. It doesn't, it happens automatically or it doesn't. 
but sitting in your own mind going, remember this, remember this. Oh God, I'm going to forget it. Oh shit. If I forget it, then this will happen. And then God, and then I'll fail at this. And like that on and on and on. We actually associate that with memory, but it's not so much memory. It's like, it's just a lot of unnecessary thought is what I've found. Right. Um, so yeah, there are adjustments for sure, especially if the awakening happens fast, um, especially deep or like non-dual awakening or realization where it's like, even the sense of subject and object isn't in your experience anymore. Um, it, it's so enticing to just sit there in that and enjoy it because it's profoundly enjoyable, right? More yeah. than probably almost anything. Um, yeah. It is more enjoyable than anything physical, I think. Uh, and so it's so it's so enticing to just sit in that, um, that, that I think it takes some time to adjust um, where what some part of your executive function was probably actually taken care of can just be sort of, um, left into the long-term memory. So like, you know, I, I live a pretty busy life right now. I still work. I don't have problems with memory. I just had to learn to relax about the fact that I can't purposely recall a memory, um, into consciousness for no reason anymore. I don't, I don't know how else to say it, but the mind just gets so quiet. But mm -hmm. I notice, like, if I need to know the dose of a medication, I know the dose of medication. It's just, it just magically appears right. out of nowhere. But there's a reason yeah. that's because I had repetitively read it over and over and used it over and over. So for me, it, you know, people do ask me this a lot. Like you're in a complex environment in the operating room, right? You're, you have all these vital signs to pay attention to a ventilator, a patient, fluid management. But my experience of it is it's very quiet. And it's just like the, the, I just know what to do. I, I don't know how else to say it. Like, I just know mm -hmm. when this, if the blood pressure drops, it's like, it could be this, this, or this, that can be an overt thought. Or I'll just notice myself looking down that algorithm, like checking, mm. is it this that's causing it? Is it that? Is it that? Is it that? And that's it. There's not something in the background going, oh my God, I hope I don't kill this patient. I'm a, I'd be a bad doctor. Am I a good doctor or a bad doctor? It's like, I wonder like, you know, what's going to happen when I go home tonight? Oh shit, I got to cook dinner. Tonight. You know, like all, when that's not all there, mm. in a sense, you, you're freed up with so much more attention to just pay attention to what's right in front of your face. Mm. And then <clears throat> something that, again, is very difficult to talk about, but the senses themselves, which are just the, sort of like the, the senses that are non-reflected. So pure sound, let's say, like the non-dual experience of that has its, in a sense, it has its own intelligence. Like it really is a self-responsive non-dualistic environment. Mm -hmm. And it just knows what to do. Just like the, the cat knows what to do. The dog knows what to do. The tree knows what to do. The human also knows what to do, but they get in their own way in, up here. Mm -hmm. um, so I find that things get more simple, efficient, um, and so forth. And for adjustment, if you notice you're forgetting a certain type of thing, then just like adjust to it, learn to set alarms or something. So for me, that, that comes into play, not when I'm at work, because I am focused on what's happening, but like, if I'm, if I have a whole day off and I'm like, okay, I have to remember at one o'clock, I have a talk with somebody or something. I may set alarm for that because it's very easy for me to just sit on the couch. And then it's five hours later and <laughs> I don't know where that time went. <laughs> so, so there's practical for me, there's practical things about this that, that are helpful, but you adjust over time with mm. it. I think that's, that's what yeah. I found. Yeah. yeah. And I do find that I think that I, um, I'm better what the, at what I do now. Like, so if I do learn something or, like I'm better at it there is mm -hmm. like like you said like that focus like when I do decide to do something there is like um not just because it's going in long-term memory but there is like a I mean I'm sure I could find lots of instances where it's not but when I'm interested mm -hmm. in that but another thing that um interests me of what you said when you were younger is that you were very empathetic mm. and how does that affect you now like yesterday I had to go to the vet with Khaleesi she had to have her heart checked you know she's got um the blood's flowing backwards in the heart it's quite common when the dog gets older and she has to go on medication for it and um and I feel like what happened is that I totally went into Khaleesi's feelings in that experience like so I totally felt what Khaleesi was feeling she doesn't think so sometimes I get people's thoughts I don't think she thinks but I felt her feelings the whole time that she's in the vet and then yeah. I felt them calm down as we were in the car leaving she doesn't like the vet um and what about you do you experience things like this or what happens with your empathy now like mine's got so much more intense like, yeah and precise yeah, it's, it's very much like that for me it's a it's situational so um so there was a period I, I remember not too long after this awakening I talked about where 
I felt like my heart expanded out to the whole world. Like I was in medical training and I remember when the big um, uh, tsunami happened and there was oh, yeah, all the devastation in, yeah. in, in, in like uh, Asia and stuff. And it was like all I could do to not just get on a plane and just go and help, even though I didn't know what I was going to do. Like I, w- I wouldn't have been able to help medically. I was still a student, but just help like rebuild houses or whatever. Like it was so hard for me to make myself not do that. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, that's not your role right now. You're in medical school. Like you have to finish your training. And so there, I went through a period where like just hearing about things and just like knowing of the injustices of the world and all that was, it was almost just overwhelming. It was like so much heart openness. And what's interesting over time is that actually... I wouldn't say it closed down. It's just that reality just got so singular into right now. Like everything that needs to be known at every level of existence is always right, is always right here. It's in these sounds and sensations and in the visual experience and all that. And it knows it has such a profound, I would say intelligence, but it's not anything like human intelligence. Um, and it's not cognitive. Uh, it has such a profound intelligence that I trust it utterly. So if there's a moment where there's no sense of anyone around or anything or self or anything, then that's perfectly okay. And that definitely happens. But other moments, like if in the moment I'm around the dog, like when I see the dogs and they, they are so excited, I feel the whole excitement. I'm like, I'm feeling their excitement. I, and it, I feel it kind of in the whole environment, which is kind of fun. The whole room is doing it in a, in a way. Um, and I've noticed that with, with all kinds of emotions and, um, I think I went through a phase where I had to actually learn like energetic boundaries to not take on people's emotions as a, a, and take responsibility for them. I remember hearing this several years ago, this phrase, I don't even know where it came from, but it just sunk in and it shifted something in me. And it was, don't take too much of people's pain away. They may need it to awaken. So, right. I, so it doesn't mean to be harsh or callous, but there was a deeper energetic knowing of, again, skillful means. Like you, you, you develop this ability to, to just feel into like where someone does need support and where sometimes they need like the scalpel. They need, you know, mm-hmm. when it comes to awakening and stuff, they need someone to help them get over their own like self-absorbed mm-hmm. story and stuff. And so, um, so on an emotional level, especially with animals or um, people too, but, but I, a lot of times what I feel in people is like a, it's like a, a mental static almost. It's like, I feel them kind of up in their head. And right. a lot of times what I'll do is just like touch them on the shoulder or something like that, because I notice just the physical contact actually will calm people down. And then all of a sudden we're talking in a more like emotional way. Like, uh, so what I notice is like with animals, it's very direct and energetic and physical for me with people. It's like, I, I have learned, this took me a long time to learn, but I learned to meet them wherever they are in that moment. So if they're in their mind, they're in their head, I can just meet them there and be mm-hmm. there with them. And then something about that acceptance will will drop us down a little bit more into the emotion body. And then mm-hmm. sometimes deeper into like the energetic body, which is starts to be about this process. Um, so I find that there's a beautiful fluidity of being able to meet the circumstances, whatever they are, through the energetics of it and really fully surrender and trust that it really doesn't matter what my expectations are about how this is supposed to go. It's just going to go how it needs to go. And the more I trust that uh, and the more... Angela's out of the way or any beliefs or resistance patterns or hesitation. Uh, as long as the more that's out of the way, the better it goes, I find. Mm. And sometimes it's yeah. only in retrospect that I see that. I mean, there, there've been times when I've had exchanges with people where, um, like I almost had a state of boundary or something or say something I did that I, I could tell was uncomfortable for them, but it just felt right in the moment. And then there might even be like afterwards, I may be like, Oh God, I hope I didn't push them too hard. And then six months later, they're like, that thing you said to me really made a difference. It took me a while to digest it. And it really pissed me off when you said it, but you know, so, so again, sometimes it's, it's even a, a something I, I, part of me maybe doesn't want to say, but I will. Uh, but I, anyway, I trust the moment in that mm. way. And I, and I'm always open to everything is my teacher. Everyone is my teacher. Every person I talk to is waking up. They always wake up the way they wake up. And that's the first time anyone's woken up. And it's the only time anyone's woken up. They don't need Mm. my story. They don't need techniques. It's their true nature, you know? (laughs) Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, right. To to just be involved with that in whatever way to me is like, I feel admiration for them. I feel I'm just going through it again myself, you know? Yeah. But they're also my teacher because every person I've worked with and interacted with, like I do pick up things from it, even if I'm not aware of it in the moment. Um, And if anything, I pick up that, it really can happen in so many different ways. As you know, mm. like you hear some of these stories and you're like, oh my God. <laughs> um, 
I have a friend, mm-hmm. I won't say too much detail, but he won't care that much. So I have a, I have a lifelong friend who um, is a soldier um, and he was active duty combat soldier for many, many years. Uh, and re- I've always really resonated with this person. Uh, just a, he's a very honest guy, um, uh, very authentic guy, but obviously that takes its toll on you. Uh, and not too long ago, um, he he actually had an awakening and it was really wild because I'd never talked to him about this, but it was oh. profound. Yeah. He called me. He's like, Hey, I want to talk to you about that stuff you talk about in your book. You know, that stuff I always <laughs> tell you, you're starting a, you know how I tell you you're starting a cult and stuff. He goes like, I'm, I'm just joking about that. Maybe we could talk about it. Right. So <laughs> then we take a walk and I'm like, I'm having an awakening, you know, and uh, so, so it can happen to anyone, anytime, yeah. any place. Doesn't matter your religion. Doesn't matter your, your political stand that's the beauty of this is like yeah. it's, it's true nature like of course yeah well that's yeah. sweet yeah. yeah and it really is like a a teaching just watching people wake up like it's um yeah it's all there i i feel like i endlessly expand mm-hmm. like it's it's all there like mirroring back aspects of itself and, yeah mm-hmm. yeah um and um, yeah, there was another thing I was going to ask. Oh, yeah. So with your teach, with teaching, what's the favorite thing that you love most about teaching? Do you have something? That it's always surprising. It's always yeah. so different. Um, I love, well, so, okay. I just did a retreat that was in-person retreat and it was b- bigger than by far than I've ever done as far as number of people there. And um I'm just so moved by people taking themselves completely out of their comfort zone in multiple ways. Often their partners are going, what the hell are you doing? You're going to spend a week by yourself and I'm watching the kids. And like, it takes a lot of courage to do that. Um, And just taking yourself, transplanting yourself out of all of your normal cues and your coping mechanisms and putting yourself in an environment that is for no other purpose than to investigate truth, living truth. Mm your true identity, however you want to say that. And everyone probably says a different way to themselves, but to see a room full of people doing that, it's awesome. It's just awe inspiring. I'm like amazed by it. Every person that comes and talks to me for the Q and a, I'm like, I just am in awe of it. It's amazing. And everyone comes from their own, everyone has their own challenges and Mm -hmm. you can't know what other people's challenges are. And some people have had absolutely horrible, horrible trauma. Mm -hmm. And yet here they are. So, so it's just the, the, it's inspiring to see it. And, uh, maybe that's like overall the, the, one of the most cool things about it. I love when someone goes through awakening, obviously, and just the feeling, I feel like I'm just going through it again with them. And it's always just the way they can go through it. It's, it's so, it's so individual in a way, but it's also the energetics of it unmistakable and it's not personal. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's, that's a beautiful, it's like watching birth or something in a way. Yeah. Um, then I'm I'm just so happy for them. So, and what do you, what do you do process wise on the retreat? Do you do like two talks a day or three talks a day, or where you do um, uh, energetic work? Or it's been a little different um, depending on the type. So I do some retreats at my house, which are just small, a couple times a year. I do them um, just for whoever I bump into. If they want to go, they can come to them. Um, but the the bigger retreats, the structure is generally, um, I start with a guided meditation in the morning and I always explain, like, I'm not trying to teach a technique. It's just, it's experiential to just get, get that taste. Um, so I start with a guided meditation and then I think late morning, there's a talk and then in early afternoon, there's a Q and a, uh, those are the parts that I'm directly involved in. And then there's rounds of about 30 minutes of silent meditation. It's structured a little bit like a Zen retreat, but not as rigorous, uh, rigorous. Um, but the other thing we've, we have usually, which is really cool is, um, poetry. And so yeah. people can get up and read poetry. Yeah. And it's so powerful to hear people's personal poetry or even the, a great poet that they want to read in that environment, you know, when everyone's just sitting and we've been sitting in Samadhi for three days and the poems are so powerful. They're beautiful. Um, mm-hmm. and then Violet does, um, so sound meditation, it's largely singing bowls, but she will sometimes use another instrument. And this time she was like on fire. Like she's, there's this place, like I told you, it holds like 3000 people and there's a hundred people. So when we did the, the um, sound meditation, they're like spread all over the room in their own little areas. <laughs> and she's got the mic and she's walking around like 
talking and doing like a guided talk to med talking meditation. And then she goes and sits and does the bowls. And like, it's just this whole like experience and the lights are down and she uses lights in the bowls. And so it's like a, it's like a visual audio experience, but it's kind of a combination between pure sound and guided meditation. So um, we've had that at all the retreats and people love that. Um, so oh, that's nice. the overall structure of the retreat. And um, yeah, yeah, it's fun. Yeah. And so when, um, I maybe didn't, I, don't, I maybe didn't ask this, maybe I just thought you were going to, or this was what your question was about, but I do get asked sometimes, what, what do I do when I'm teaching or how do I teach or what techniques and all that? And I don't really, I have some techniques that I think work really well for first awakening, like Mu in Zen, they use Mu. What is Mu? I don't, I don't, I don't even, know what, I don't even know what that is, Mu. It's M-U. It's based on an old uh, Zen exchange, um, uh, uh, a guy named Joshu uh, and a monk. And jo uh, he asked Joshu, does a dog have Buddha nature? And Joshu just said, moo. Right. And so, <laughs> so the beauty of moo is it's kind of like, you can almost say it's kind of like a mantra to start with. You just kind of intone it or... But then at some point, your teacher kind of directs you to like start asking, well, what is it? What is Mu? And then they do Doksan where you come in face to face with the teacher and you try to demonstrate a koan or demonstrate your understanding. So you'll come in and be like, okay, I know what Mu is. Mu is pure consciousness. And, and the teacher will say, no, 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 that's con that's conceptual. Go back and bring me Mu. And so you go back and you think of some other shit and come in and they're like, no, 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 it's conceptual. Then it starts becoming experiential. You know, you feel something going on, some shifts, and you'll come back and a teacher will say, okay, it's better, but it's still it's still not Moo. I want you to bring, I want I want Moo to walk in and sit in front of me on that cushion and I'll know it when it happens, right? So then it's like, it becomes this almost an obsession. Like what the fuck is Moo? What, because you, at some point you realize you're exhausting all the conceptual possibilities, but you know it's, you, you actually have to believe it is something because the teacher tells you it's something and you've seen other people wake up you've seen the ken show experiences mm. so you 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 believe it but you're like your mind is spinning like what the fuck could it be like what could it possibly be and so then it just becomes moo 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 to where it's just moo you become so absorbed in moo there's only moo no, no separation at all right this works really well for a, a an intellectual mind for a cognitive like obsession and it just becomes moo until you can walk in until moo does walk in and sits in front of the teacher and then when the teacher asks the questions moo answers them it's really really cool and instinctual so sometimes you know i'll recommend like a one-pointed approach like that or self-inquiry but but if i'm honest what i actually do when i'm interacting with someone is i just feel into where they're fixating right. because reality doesn't fixate you know yeah. like in the heart sutra it says freedom of, of delusive hindrance so yeah. from that place of freedom from de delusive hindrance, anything that fixates or forms a frame of reference or a view feels a little off in a sense. Yeah. So I meet them there and then we just we just sit there with it. And then when you're in a view, when you're experiencing yourself or a view as a view, then some deeper knowledge tends to come or some deeper instinct tends to come and the view starts to dissolve a little bit and all of a sudden you're you're not looking this way anymore you're looking this way and that way right yeah, like yeah. it's just oh a paradigm shift you know so that's how i work with people is just feeling into what's going on with them and uh meeting them where they are and just working through it and mm. they always find their own way into awakening mm. yeah yeah oh, yeah that's that's beautiful it's nice that you have um all these structures and different techniques to use as well it's so different every teacher what they what they bring when you were saying the moo thing it reminded me of when i went to see muji years ago this was in india mm -hmm. and this person was like reading a poem and in the poem they were very clever at the way they wrote it they were like even all the cows are singing your name moo. <laughs> i love it <laughs> oh are we there okay what happened there uh don't know okay is it still recording yeah, it's still I think point. so. Yeah, yeah, something uh, happens. Yeah, nice. I don't know if I I can think of any more questions. Um. Yeah, anything else you would like to tell me? 
I didn't ask. Uh, yeah, I would say, because I try to gear anything I talk about, whether, even if someone's interviewing me, I gear it towards anyone who could be listening. And yeah. I really always try to say, hey, listen, the terms we're using may not resonate with you, but there's the fact that you're watching this, like something's resonating and you you can find your way into that. And, and you have mm -hmm. the right to investigate however that needs to happen for you. you know. And so I would just tell anyone listening that and um, be willing to be surprised, be willing to be yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah, and that's okay. I love it how positive you are about um, the process. Like, um, like I love the positivity and the confidence. Like the, yeah, you feel really established um, in knowing the direction that you're taking someone, but also this positivity. Like it's really beautiful. Like it's inclusive for everybody. Yeah. Like it's. Yeah, and and sometimes I'll say this just to be clear, like. I have no agenda that anyone needs to wake up because I don't, because there's no one who's not awake. Yeah. It, there are people waking up, but there's no one who's not awake. When when yeah. you realize this, as I described this, like no self thing, it's everything's a paradox. Everything's a paradox. And the more you, the more you're comfortable with paradox, the more you'll experience reality as it actually is, which is completely paradoxical. So <laughs> there are people who want to wake up and there are people who are waking up and that's awesome, but I don't have an agenda. I don't need to wake people up. And, and if somebody's not moving in that way right now, that's fine. They may later mm -hmm. or they may not, but it doesn't actually matter. Your, your, your true nature is your true nature. Right. So, um, so yeah, I guess I, I'm, I, I intentionally, uh, put this out there in, in my book and in videos and stuff in, in that has a context already that I'm going to already assume you're interested in awakening. And that's where I'm going to talk from every time. doesn't mean that that's what you should do. You only, you know what you should do, but I, mm -hmm. but I will assume you've felt into that a little bit. And if you haven't, I can help you do that too. Like we can look and see, maybe you have a different motivation and take care of that first. And then you might decide whether this kind of process is for you. Um, mm. So, so again, it comes back to, to trusting yourself, not your thoughts, but your instinct, you know, getting mm. down enough to trust your, your instinct. Um, and so, yeah, it's not necessarily, there's no need for everyone to wake up, but every single person of course has at least the potential because, mm. Hey, it's their true nature. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and get like, away time, from it. <laughs> yeah, you can't. And time is such a weird thing, like you say. Like I sometimes think that, like, like or feel like, um, like past lives. Like there's the possibility that they can ha be happening simultaneously now. Like, mm -hmm. um, even not just as in like um, past lives in a different time, but it could be that you're kind of. I know it's. It's it's like it could be your past lives are actually living now. Oh, that's mm -hmm. weird. Like and your future lives. And it's like it it's really like waking up really isn't a time bound thing. It's such an abstract idea that there is linear yeah. time. Like it's really, really just us that think like that. Just yes. humans. So can I get scientific and nerdy on you? Yeah, go for it. So uh, this is uh, something that struck me, I think two nights ago, I was watching a documentary about like the universe. So like, if you're looking at the Andromeda galaxy, which is, I don't know how many millions of light years away, or it's a long ways away, it, but it's so big that you can see the core nucleus of it with the naked eye, I guess, if it's a really dark night, but with a telescope, it's very obvious. So if you're looking at the Andromeda galaxy, the photons that literally came from that galaxy are striking your retina, right? And so a photon is, is, a, is a particle of light. So because of Einstein's special theory of relativity, it's been proven again and again through all these like nuanced um, experiments that it's actually true that from the frame of reference of that photon, there's no time and there's no distance. Mm. So that photon is literally in contact with you and the Andromeda galaxy at exactly the same time. Mm. How can you say that that galaxy is distant? And it, it is from the frame of reference of a, of a person, mm. of a mental construct. But even scientifically speaking, from the yeah, that's beautiful. From relative, it you you are literally in contact and that, through light, um, yeah, and, and right. And and another thing um, is what you described about parallel lives. Like I'm I'm cautious to talk about that stuff because it, it can easily become a mental thing. Mm. Like oh, I chose to come into this life and I made a plan and I came and now I'm manifesting and you know some of that can get very much heady and it can sort of contribute to mind identification. But my instincts are what you said is actually pretty accurate. And 
even that comes, I can give a scientific model for that in the, um, the, uh, space time interval, which is a, is, is an equation they had to develop to make relativity make sense with causality. The space time intervals is this mathematical description, which again, has not been disproven. And it goes exactly with Einstein's relative relativity theory. And that is all events are simultaneously existing. Mm. That's it. So it's causality which is just conditions that are appearing out of who knows where that create the sense of whether something happened first or after it's, it's not, it's not anything to do with location or time because location and time are actually relative. They're relative. They're not mm. actually existing. And, mm. and all I can tell people is you can actually directly experience that. I don't know how, I don't know how I, I don't know how I, I could never explain it to you, but you can directly experience that. And it's a fucking trip and why not? Right. Um, you'll go through, you'll go through things you didn't think you'd have to go through to get there, but, um, it's not, you're not getting somewhere, but it, it you know, strangely it's the, the boundary, the barriers are, are really on the emotion, human emotion spectrum, largely fear, mm. shame, guilt, helplessness, being willing to go through those and fully embody those and experience them as they are, as whatever they are. Um, strangely, that's the way through. But mm -hmm. there is a knowing that is so profound um, that's possible, but it's a knowing of by no one in a sense. You know, yeah, yeah. you have to you have to get everything out of the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, life is magical. It mm -hmm. really like it's it's yeah, completely unlogical. Like it's mm -hmm. the idea that logic is more true than magic is. Um, yeah. Is is that, well, I mean, it's just typical of our society and our brain. It's like what our brain wants and needs and thinks it has to have. Yeah. So there was an, another insight that came to me after that that second big shift, and it was this: there is no way that things actually are. That it was just obvious. Like, there's no way that things are in the way the mind makes things. Like, it's this way or it's that way. It's either this or that. That's not how reality functions. Like it's not any set way. It's not, it's not even, it's not even bound by being or non-being. It can be being and non-being. It's it, it, so there's no way the mind can get around that. There's no way you can imagine your way into that, but you can damn well def directly know it mm. or di directly experience it. I'll say, you know, mm. um, yeah. yeah, nice. And, and it's also go... perfectly mundane. Yeah. It's, Sitting here talking, walking, going to the bathroom, going to sleep, waking up. Feeding yourself. That seems like the endless thing. We've got to feed the machine again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that we're wearing the same clothes as when we did this last interview with the same oh. hair. So it looks like we just went from one to the other. Right. Actually, different days. <laughs> so what do you what do you find? I guess with teaching yourself, with, with your teaching or interactions with people, what do you find um, the, 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 the barriers are as far as what, what hangs people up or common obstructions and things like that? I mean, it's the typical one. It's, it's like the, the, biggest obstruction is the belief in the thought and the feelings and the sensation the belief that that's true for mm -hmm. me like it's it's I I say this all the time but it's like empty words in a way because until you've really seen that like yeah. it's it's um the belief that that story is true you know the story that you're unhappy because of that yeah. you're feeling the way because of it's seemingly like you're feeling the way bad because you just had a fight that's what it seems like but it's really not the unhappiness. It's not the problem. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not really, it's just an, it's an appearance and it's also not really true. Like, yeah. and, and you can go to such depth on that. Like, I think you were speaking about it, like really like the, everything you feel, think, see everything isn't truth. Mm -hmm. but it, it's sometimes it feels like empty words. So I think this is the biggest barrier is the, propensity for people to believe that mm -hmm. their experience is true is real mm -hmm. um yeah. and that's it's it's um 
Do you find that when people hear that message, then they do this thing where they go, oh, it's not true, uh, th but, th but still still holding a, the same maybe distance from your experience, but you just decided now it's not true. So it's yeah. just, it's just true, but an opposite polarity in a mental way though. Yeah. You know, yeah, like yeah, sometimes yeah. I see that where it's like, I get people leave comments. They're like, you're talking dualistically. There's no self. There's no, this, there's no, that there's no, not, all that. you know? And it's like, well, it's one thing to learn that. I mean, yeah. but to really digest it and yeah, see no, that, it, yeah. yeah, not only is your story not true, it doesn't have truth value. It's yeah. not in the realm of reality. It's, it's not true or false. It's not in the realm of true or false, or else you'll just get into the game of true or false, pushing and pulling and so forth. Mm. But but I agree with you. It, it feels so hypnotically true. Yeah. Until it doesn't. Yeah. And and like you were saying that the biggest um ones that feel the truth, tr the truest are the ones that ironically contain the negative feelings like fear and shame. Yeah, I think yeah, I think when people are happy, they can maybe easily more easily see that it's not true. <laughs> Yeah. but when they're scared of it they're like no i'm pretty sure that i'm going to be eaten up by the lack of money dynamic i don't yeah. know if you've got um what is it that we've got fuel issues or gas issues have you got that in america like our bills are, prices like are definitely going up it's not like europe but the prices are, are yeah. going up and right. all that yeah so it's um so that's the biggest thing that i would say and then after that i would say it go i feel and this is just my current perspective on it is that we spoke about this last time that non-duality has a attraction to personality disorders and um and so i also experience um people thinking i'm talking about thinking that what's being talked about is actually like disassociation or um or a lack of a self in a negative way you know like um like uh as in you know you never formed a self as a child not as in the waking up like so and you neural diverse people people often don't form a self and i'm not talking about that i mean in a personality issue way um or avoidant people so people that haven't developed a a strong sense of self or avoidant people and they think that that's what's being talked about and they become absolutely convinced that that's what's being talked about and um i see that a lot and um that's very difficult to interact with because they're so convinced that that, that we're talking about the same thing yeah yeah i agree with that it's it's a, almost uh, what i'm picking up as you're saying it and i've definitely had experience with this as well as it's something like um you've learned to invalidate yourself so much, however you learned, maybe your parents did it or something, then you've learned to do it to yourself. And then when you hear this, it's like, oh, now I can really invalidate myself, but <laughs> it just becomes a more and more dissociated yeah. experience yeah. instead of an integrated uh, yeah. experience. And it can lead like, to really horrible kinds of helplessness. It's not a yeah. Good yeah. And like, I try to say, even though I think that this is slightly wrong as well, that's the other problem with speaking about this is it's hard to get it really accurately you know if it's not containing some form of love mm -hmm. then we're not talking about the same thing like yeah. i mean um love does come and go to an extent but it is also like a going in or opening of the heart like a real yeah. like like um love thing a love affair yeah. but yeah th i mean this is difficult this this area like it begins and that gets really murky that bit like that's hard to to navigate that part mm -hmm. So my first one is the belief, I would say, in the thoughts, like um, the, the sensations and the experience. And then the second one is these kind of like personality issues where they think that we're talking about the same thing, either from an avoidant perspective or from a perspective where they haven't stabilized a sense of self. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's interesting when you were just reiterating the thing about belief in the story and sensations and all that, like picked up something a little more nuanced that may be helpful to point out. And it's, as you know, it's not just a belief, but it it's largely belief based, but it's like, I'm looking at, well, what is that belief made out of? What does it feel like? And yeah. it feels like, it feels like reaction. Like you're reacting to all these aspects of what you think is yourself. And then the reaction becomes your sort of, it feels like who you are in a way. Mm. Right. 
Um, and then you can do the same thing with concepts, even spiritual concepts, you know, you can believe mm -hmm. them or not believe them and you're still reacting to, but, but to thoroughly, however that happens to know fully all these sensations and, and thoughts and emotions, paradoxically, when you see there's no identity in it, there's just no identity there, then it's, then you don't have to avoid it anymore. Mm. Strangely, you can sort of just be it, you know, it's, yeah. there may still be some struggle and, and that will soften up over time but yeah. yeah again a paradox um yeah did it, and did you say what you find hardest about teaching you asked me the question did you yeah oh um yeah i forgot if you said answer that i think you didn't i think because i see things in in the terms of like fixation you know you can fixate the right. masculine or the feminine you can fixate and you know whatever all these different ways Basically, it's some form of pushing or pulling and and polarizing, um, which mind identification is just a stable polarized so, uh, dissociation. <laughs> it's a dissociation, but it's an agreed upon socially endorsed disassociation. So there are rewards in the social matrix for it. And so it kind of can stay that way and even find a certain kind of comfort in its own stability. Mm. Now, it wasn't for me. It was never comfortable and it was never stable. But for some, I think it can be. Um, but because I think because of that, I, I tend to just see things in, in terms of like the fixations tend to pop up in a reasonably predictable fashion. But the first one really is, and this draws from my own experience, knowing that it's actually possible that there's something beyond your own mind identified world, mm -hmm. knowing some, not a thing, not a place, but some possibility that you can actually do something about the suffering, like, mm. you know, far bigger than the, than the scale of you. So just having that sense, however that sense comes, um, be often it's bumping into the right person, you know, mm. watching a non-duality video. Uh, sometimes it's a tragedy. Sometimes it's mm. some really bad thing that happens, uh, losing somebody. So I think that the first sort of barrier is just knowing there's a possibility there. Um, and then the second barrier I think is probably some sort of fear barrier. Like I've, I've seen many people who are like, oh yeah, I know what that is. And they get kind of interested and then they get terrified and they just go off in a completely different direction for a number of months or years and then come back. But so the, the second one is not understanding the nature of the fear barrier mm. uh, that, that, and I, that's why I talk about it so frequently that often when people are really coming up right to that edge of awakening, like it is a massive fear. Not everybody has that, but it's pretty common. Like mm. your body's shaking and their heart rate's really high and you, you literally think you're going to die and you're so desperate. You're like, well, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die, but I'm going to go through this. So mm. I try to sort of normalize that just to say like, Hey, it's part in a way it's part of the hero's journey. You know? Um, I love that, that, that in star Wars where you, Luke Skywalker and his young naiv naivete is going to go off into the cave and Yoda's sitting there with him. And he, he tells Yoda, Oh, I'm not scared. And Yoda just says, you will be, <laughs> you will be. <laughs> and I, I feel like that a lot with people who are like, Oh, I'm not afraid of death. I'm like, yeah, we'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out exactly how deep your fear goes because you have to go through it, you know? So I, I try to talk about emotion a lot and give those expectations that, hey, it's not just normal. It's par for the course that you're going to feel some intense shit that you didn't even know was there. And it may yeah. surprise you how much is there. And it's going to be shame and helplessness and fear. And yeah. they're all perfectly okay. They all had developmental times in our life where they were, they served us, you know, for developing as a human being. So, so I think that probably is the second biggest barrier is, um, is feeling fear and not realizing what it is and just being like, whoa, 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 I don't want to have anything to do with that. Usually that just takes care of itself. At some point, the insight kind of comes back and you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to go check that out again, you know? And at some point you go through the fear, you know, it just happens. Um, mm. so I'd say those are probably the two, um, most common the dissociation thing is very challenging. Someone who's, who tends to really dissociate and they want to use the, especially like a, a sort of radical non-dual message to <laughs> not do anything, not <laughs> look, not feel. Um, it's not what it's for. That, that message doesn't mean don't feel your feelings. You'll never realize what non-dual really is, which is no separation and essentially no form uh, or perception. You're not going to know, you're not going to ever realize that until you go through the, the shadow. You have mm. to do the shadow work, however you do it. If it's sweeping leaves for four years, I absolutely love that story, by the way. Um, <laughs> somewhat, so the comments on the video we made were very positive and people loved it and stuff. And, you know, there's always going to be one person. There's like someone who's like, I don't like Lisa. She doesn't have a teaching. What's her teaching? And I was like, Jesus, did you watch the video? Her whole life is the teaching. Her whole, like you described 
complete surrender. Like you went and sat with a guy for four years who was constantly pointing and probably driving you completely out of your mind. And you're sweeping leaves and going through all the shadow work completely out of your element. You left your training, like, like your life is what it means to be that committed to this, this, this truth, you know? So, um, so everyone does it in such different ways, yeah. but, but I think the third thing is now you want a technique and techniques can be helpful and valuable, but they can also be very limiting. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think the third barrier is just really getting people to orient toward a sort of surrendered way of mm -hmm. moving into this, just opening, opening the feminine aspect. Um, and, uh, and when that comes online, it, people wake up fast. I notice when, when someone just becomes open to it and like, I'll feel whatever I have to feel. So be it. Like, this is the most important thing to me. And I'm going to do what I have to mm -hmm. do to put myself in the right experiences. I know it's not going to be comfortable. I'm willing to go through it. I'm willing to feel it. That's somebody who's going to wake up fast if they, mm -hmm. if they stay there, you know? Um, so. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And then I think deeper stages of realization are interesting because everyone's so different with this, but some people have, they have a true awakening, can show awakening. And sometimes it's spontaneous, but maybe 20 years later before they start to have deeper insights like non-dual mm -hmm. and, and equanimity. Um, so I think in deeper stages of realization, it's, it's actually sometimes really helpful to have a certain technique, a certain approach to, to investigating the senses, you know, and a lot of people figure those out by themselves. They just they just know to keep putting their attention in the sounds, mm. in mm. the sensations, in the forms and colors, and just keep doing that and just absorbing yourself into the sense fields. Uh, so some people do that intuitively, I think, but some people don't. And I think it can be helpful to have certain pointings at that point um, mm. with the subtle, because the, the deeper insights are so subtle, right? Mm. For some people, the subject object just collapses and you're like, holy shit, there's no boundaries anywhere, you know? And other people are like, what the fuck? What is, <laughs> I don't get it. Like, I don't get that, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. 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 It's amazing. The, um, the infinite ways in which people wake up and change and evolve. Like, it's really fascinating mm -hmm. hearing the different stories and how there is no one shoe fits all. It's yeah. really unique. It sounds like you had a bit of an Eckhart Tolle one, like that was a bit like from the depths of suffering, like the like not so much training before. Like I think Eckhart Tolle did some work, but not so much. Like he knew about it, mm -hmm. but it was like a yeah, like like a big. It there wasn't like immense spiritual practice beforehand. Yeah, I would agree. It was. It was the, my practice was suffering. Mm. It wasn't voluntary. You know, it was what it was, but, and, and that's another thing that I feel, I felt inclined to write the book for, and I, and I keep working on my YouTube channel just to hopefully get, that's really there just to promote the book. Cause like traditional publishing anymore is kind of, it's not dead, but it's, it's much, much less common. Even the really big authors now are mm -hmm. going uh, individual publishing because the, the industry is changing. So you're kind of, you kind of have to promote your own thing. So my hope is it gets in the hands of some people who were where I was like really suffering, really, really the kind mm. of person that could go scoot, shoot up a school, you know, mm. like you, you just so much repressed emotion and all that. And not everybody who's going through that is going to be oriented to awakening, but when they are, man, I got some good news for you because you know, that you don't have to live like that. Mm. And for me, it was pretty. Yeah. Weird. And I think it's really beautiful. I was thinking about that when you were telling your story that like I come across a lot of young men that are really, really, really suffering. Like, um, yeah, you know, when I talked about the suicides in our last talk, it was predominantly young men. I think mm -hmm. young men in our society are super vulnerable. And yeah. um, and I think that, that your channel and speaking with people is particularly for the young men. I feel I, I'm you're for everybody, but I just feel like there is some connection that you've got because of your story and because of just the way you are. Mm. Like, um, yeah, it's really good for them, and I'm sure it will end up in lots of their hands. I'm sure there's lots of people that listen to my channel, like young men that listen to my channel, and will find that helpful. Well, thank you. You know, uh, I feel the same about you in one sense, and that is. I've, I, unfortunately you don't have a lot of openings or any openings at this point, but, uh, but I, I've, as you know, I've sent people to you and, and, um, you transmit so powerfully in the feminine spectrum, 
you also transmit in the masculine spectrum, but I mean, you, you transmit so powerfully in the feminine spectrum, but it's, it's strangely easy to overlook, I think, until someone has some insight and then they'll, they'll start to feel it. Um, but yeah, I, I often want to, you know, and I encourage people to go check you out and check out your channel. Um, and it's, it's very interesting. The, the very masculine mind has trouble with it. They're like, well, yeah. well, she doesn't tell what she doesn't tell what the technique is. What's she talking about? I don't get it. What, and it's like, stop thinking and just watch, like, just feel into what she's talking about. Like it's, it's a, you know, but it's not about you, Lisa Carnes. It's about, in a sense, like a lot of our society is sort of skewed to the masculine or mind mm -hmm. identification is a sort of a masculine movement. It's a disintegrative movement. There's nothing wrong with masculine energy and there's nothing wrong with feminine energy. But when masculine distortion is there, which is interpreted as duality and feminine distortion is there, which is interpreted as enmeshment and all these other things, those cause a lot of suffering. Mm -hmm. But to to be able to find the the conjugate, it's like, you know, if you have a masculine distortion, the conjugate is, is a feminine non-distorted expression. And I can soften that so much. Like that's, that's where I want a lot of guys to go is towards that mm -hmm. feminine aspect. Um, and sh somehow getting them to realize like, that's what you really want. You think you want it by getting laid. You think you want it by finding the perfect girlfriend and all that. No, what you want is to know it directly. And there, mm -hmm. there's only one place you're going to know it directly. And that's through yourself, you know? So, so I think your expression is hugely powerful for, for guys too. And, um, I appreciate that you're out there. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Mm. Yeah. I do. I do sometimes attract also, in, I, I attract some very heady men, but I also attract a lot of neurodiversity mm. as well. Um, yeah, that interests me. Yeah. Yeah, I That's, think neurodiverse I, people are, are actually reasonably good at waking up in certain ways, I found. Yeah, they, they, said, have, they have the experience, maybe as children, they had trouble forming a fully functioning dissociated ego. Like some senses are so strong and powerful that they're overwhelming. Um, so later on, that may be really beneficial to them. And they, and they kind of have an innocence, like, mm -hmm. like a very... They're very in, in um, even if they're like sometimes with neurodiverse people, not all the time, it's so different, but they're insanely intelligent and they like might have obsessed and learned certain subjects. And, um, but even with that, they kind of have this like innocence there. You can kind of see this like childlikeness there that's not from a personality protection or, or, or like falling into being young to, um, yeah to please the other or something it's it's like a real innocence that's there mm. as well yeah it's, it's sweet yeah so maybe we've uh, spoken enough now yeah, yeah that was yeah. super beautiful thank you for doing that, that thanks for yeah. inviting me yeah always good to chat yeah nice yeah. all right